Hello, and thank you so much for joining us today for this, the first of a series of workshops on the new AMEB violin syllabus. My name is Stephen Hodgson, and I'm the head of publishing at AMEB. And very shortly, Philippa Page, principal consultant for the Violin Syllabus Review Project, will be workshopping the new violin technical work from preliminary through to grade eight. Philippa uh, led the full review of the AMEB violin syllabus over the last couple of years, working with a team of specialists on revising every aspect of the syllabus, technical work, repertoire, and sight reading, ensuring that the review was coherent across the various levels and also across the various aspects of the syllabus. I'd like to start by thanking each member of the violin syllabus and publications team for their dedication, their expertise, and for the enormous amount of work done to bring the new violin syllabus and publications to life. Thank you, Philippa Page, of course, Julie Hewison, level one consultant, Karen Chan, level two consultant, and Finton Murphy, level three consultant. During the workshop, Philippa will take you through each grade of the new technical work with some emphasis on what has changed from the previous technical work, as well as detailing some of the thinking behind the new material and finally covering some possible approaches to this material. If you have any questions throughout the course of the workshop, please feel free to type them into the chat at the bottom of your Zoom window and we'll do our very best to answer them either during the course of the workshop if possible or at the end if time permits. Finally, at the conclusion of the workshop, I'll take a talk a little bit about a very exciting competition that has been launched by AMEB with our very generous competition partner, Glanville & Co. So if you want to find out how to win a Glanville violin, you'll have to stay until the end. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce our principal consultant, Philippa Page. Although for many of you, Philippa will need no introduction. Philippa, studied violin with Robert Pickler in Sydney before undertaking further study in London, where she worked for several years as a freelance violinist with a number of London orchestras and chamber ensembles, and also developed her teaching career. After a further two years as a member of the Bilbao Symphony Orchestra in Spain, she returned to Australia, where she joined the Sydney Symphony Orchestra, with whom she played for 30 years. Philippa was appointed to the Sydney Conservatorium part-time staff in 1985, and currently teaches at the Conservatorium High School, as well as maintaining a private studio. She presents masterclasses, lectures and workshops, adjudicates I Steadfords and competitions, and has worked extensively as tutor and advisor to organizations such as the Sydney and Australian Youth Orchestras. Philippa was the string advisor to AMEB New South Wales for many years, and was a syllabus writer for the two previous revisions of the violin syllabus. Welcome, Philippa. Thank you, Steve, and welcome everybody. Um, so I'm going to talk about this technical workbook. Um, I'd like to start by giving a quick overview of the new book. Um, so in line with the feedback from teachers over the past 10 years, and more particularly from the focus groups, we've aimed to streamline the new technical workbook so there's a little less material to present in the actual exam situation than what we had previously. Uh, we've kept to the pattern of having a limited number of keys in each grade so as to avoid the candidate having to jump between a number of keys in the exam situation. Teachers will obviously cover other relevant keys as they are needed. Um, there are now four exercises in each grade with a clear focus on the techniques relevant to the current and the upcoming grade. In some cases the length of the actual exercises has been cut down a little the aim is to consolidate the technique at a given level and also to introduce techniques that will appear in the next level so that they're up and running for the repertoire in the next grade. So in level one, we're mainly looking at left hand and left arm issues, shifting and position work and a progressive introduction of bowing skills and maybe some simple double stops or chords or just a couple of other little things. In level two, we continue that development of shifting into higher positions now, more focus on tone production, further development of bowing skills, along with a few new techniques that will appear in the repertoire on these levels like harmonics and ornaments and various forms of pizzicato. 
One new thing you will notice in this new edition of the technical book is the occasional little grey box marked extra for experts, where there might be an additional useful scale or two, or some ideas on developing vibrato, or a tiny exercise for left hand pizzicato, who knows, all sorts of things. Um, these are entirely optional and not for presentation at the examination, but they might come in handy if this issue comes up in a piece or just in the, child, in the students playing in general. So I thought it might be interesting to give a little outline of the process that goes on when writing and putting together a publication like this. It's quite a big project. To start with, all four syllabus writers work th and Steve worked through the, the previous book and looked at everything again whilst referring to the feedback from the teachers' focus groups and the input from examiners about items that didn't work very well or took too long to play and of course the many bits of feedback that have come to light in the last 10 years from colleagues and from our own observations when teaching. We came up with guidelines for what we want to change and to add. Then I spend a lot of time revisiting a wide range of scale system, methods books, study books, everything I could lay my hands on, and then hunting out recent publications for more ideas. And I also ask for suggestions from the other syllabus writers for things that they particularly wanted to consider. Um, all the content in the scale and arpeggio section was reconsidered, and the exercises were assessed for their suitability and their length and their playability. So there was a lot of writing and rewriting of exercises, adjustment, more discussion, more rewriting, until we were happy with the result. It's everything from fingerings to ranges of scales, bowings, keys, everything was put through a consultative process. And this took place over slightly more than two years due to the constraints of lockdowns and such like. We're all experts on using Zoom now. Um, so, and sending things by fax, and, or not fax, and email and everything you can think of. We had a, a, a sharp learning curve in technology. So, once we had the first proof of the whole thing, we spent some time playing through the entire contents to see how it all flowed and how everything felt. And that again resulted in some adjustments, because when you actually play it through, you think, oh no, you've got to tinker with this and tinker with that. It takes a while to play through the whole book too. That's quite a marathon. After that, there were several rounds of proofreading to get rid of the gremlins, like fingerings that have found their way to the wrong notes and a few errant bowings. So the whole thing was quite a big project, quite a marathon, and I think we're all happy with the result. Very happy, actually. So now just a general word about how we approach technical work. Um, it's so easy for it to fall into the too hard basket and get left as the last priority when our students are practicing. It's you know, it's not the favourite necessarily part of the um, lesson and the practice time. And we've probably all done that ourselves at, at various stages. It's, it's important in the preface to the new book, for instance, it gives some really good points about why we study technique and it's worth reading to get some ideas about how to enthuse your students about this part of their work. I read it through the other day and it's great actually. <clears throat> I didn't write it, no, the, I think Steve had a lot to do with that one. Um, in a nutshell, technique consolidates the basic building blocks used in playing, so that when you're learning something new, those basic aspects are already internalised. So if you already know the scale or the arpeggio patterns, that bit of the piece is just going to fall into place, for instance. And that's a good point to keep on mentioning when you're teaching this stuff. Technical work's not generally noted for its musical interest, but then, working on technical development and material that's not too musically demanding enables you to focus on the technical issues at hand without too much distraction. So there's a reason for that. Sometimes a bit of interest can be added if you think of playing the technical work in a particular style. I went to a masterclass once, many years ago, with Perry Hart, who was a wonderful violinist and teacher great fun and she decided to do a master class on Shevchuk bowing exercises and I thought my goodness that will be a challenge to make interesting so I took my students poor things and off we went and she had them playing these little exercises and then she'd say play it in the style of Beethoven blank look but you know she said well, try this spiccato try that spiccato no play it like Mozart that's a different spiccato isn't it now what about doing it like Shostakovich? And then the up bow staccato. 
but do it, do it in the style of Debussy. So it was. It, it turned into the most fascinating, hilarious afternoon. We all enjoyed ourselves enormously, and it certainly changed my perspective on Shevchuk in the process. Um, so, and the other trick I found that's quite helpful is to cross-reference a bit, so that if the student's playing a piece. You can remind them how, oh, when you worked on that technique in a certain exercise or study, say, wow, hasn't that paid off? If you hadn't done such and such a study, you wouldn't be able to play that bit so well now, would you? Um, and that can be motivating as well. So anyway, some little thoughts about technique. And now I'm going to start uh, working my way through the book, but there are some general notes that are worth taking on board first. The technical works in two sections. The first part is scales and arpeggios and so on, and then there's the exercises. So in the first section, um, the fingerings are optional. There are often two fingerings. Uh, there'll be one above the notes and one below, so you've got a choice. But if you've got another fingering system, that's fine too. The important thing is that it's a fingering that's fluent and will work in the repertoire. The first section of the technical work needs to be played from memory. Fingerings and bowings in the exercises are mandatory, but the exercises can be played from music. So two slightly different things. The content of the technical workbook should be thought of, I think, as a subset of what needs to be covered at each level. We can't hear everything that's relevant in one short exam, and we certainly can't fit everything that you might need in one book. Um, so it's an it's a subset or, or a set of examples or a demonstration of what, you've achieved, what, you, what you can do at that level. So it's worth extending the student by doing some other relevant scales or exercises or studies so their grasp of the technique is solid. And it depends, of course, on what the student needs. So as I'm talking, I will often mention something that you could use that might extend a particular technical issue if you need it. Um, the other thing to keep on hammering away at is really good practice strategies if you want to get good results. Um, I know this is stating the obvious, obvious to, to all of the teachers who are watching, but it does need to be emphasised. Um, I was teaching my nephew to, uh, giving my nephew a driving lesson the other day and he was saying, oh, it's fine to drive with one hand, and I was, Ooh. Um, and um, I said to him, look, if you practice it that way, and he said, I'll be fine in the exam, I'll have a couple of lessons just beforehand and then I'll do it properly in the exam. And I said, not likely. I said, what you practice and what you practice and do most often is what you'll do under pressure. And the same thing applies to the technical work. If you practice it well, then it will work under pressure. Um, slow practice is useful. It's also really useful to incorporate rhythm and bowing variations into the scale and arpeggio practice, incremental tempos on the metronome. The Galamian um, method of scales has a wonderful set of bowings and rhythm patterns and I find these really helpful for speeding up scales because it's like you look at the scale from you play this bit slow and this bit fast and then you change it around so it's looking at the scale from a lot of different points of view. And I do find it really helps with sort of getting them more even and speeding them up and then you can apply it in the, re in the repertoire as well. So now we get to the actual book. Um, I'll give a detailed overview of the materials in each grade so that I can point out what you'll find there and what may have changed from the previous technical workbook. And then I might give some a few suggestions on how to work on them and a few demonstrations. So if you, if you have the book, have a look at preliminary. So starting with preliminary, the keys themselves haven't changed from the previous book. So we still have A and D major and the top part of G major, which gives us the two most common finger patterns and the most frequently encountered keys for this level. So you've got two and three together and one and two together. And just also note that the first bowing in the scales and arpeggios now asks for long bows with full tone rather than whole bows, which makes it a little easier. Whole bows is a bit of a stretch just at the beginning. Um, and there's an extra for experts in the scales and arpeggios so that C major is there as well if you need it. It might be useful if you choose the um, 10,000 miles away piece in list C. Um, it's the same pattern as G major of course but it can help to actually see what it looks like. So again it's not mandatory 
but it might be useful particularly if you're playing a piece in C major. Now in the exercises um, I'll explain a bit about all of them as I work through each grade, but in general um, we've kept it to four exercises. We have left hand, ex left hand exercises appearing first and then always something for bowing at the end. That's the overall pattern, but as the level of playing becomes more advanced there'll be more instances where the focus has to be on both with a combination of left hand and bowing to get the res desired result. So if you have a look at uh, PA, that's the first exercise in preliminary. This exercise aims to develop an awareness of the different placements of the left arm for each string so that the fingers can always move comfortably and reach their notes. And now I have to change my glasses and grab a violin. So what we're looking at is, just so you can see, if you're plucking on the G string, that elbow is going to be a little further over so that you can reach it back. Back and then a big swing. So we're looking for that not just stretching across and not making any adjust adjustment of the elbow. I don't think that screen is quite the right angle. Um, now PB this is an introduction to the action that the left arm, arm performs in shifting and we're using harmonics as the upper marker. You'll find this occurs in quite a lot of pieces at this level. It's certainly in Flash of Lightning in List A and Emma Greenhill's Desert Rain in List B and quite a few of the pieces in the manual. Now, again, you're looking at what the arm is doing as you go from first position up to that harmonic making sure the thumb goes with the hand, so you have So just getting that mobility started and the shifting will come in the next uh, level. PC is about how to manage the bow and string crossings in various shapes and forms. Um, they come in many shapes and forms, of course. Um, the Mary Cohen study in List A uses the pattern in the first line, which is this one. Where this part of the arm stays pretty much still, and that part does a sort of a the sort of action you'd use if you were egg beating, or as one of my students says said um, beating hollandaise sauce, so we call that the hollandaise sauce bowing now. So you've got and then at the end of the exercise you've got a big string crossing where this part of the arm has to work. So you're actually doing that action. And um, and the, uh, that's my place now, yeah the Mary Cohen study uses the first pattern. You'll find in Marjorie Dawes' Polka and List C, you've got the reverse with the changing note on the lower string. So you've got the egg beating going the other way. And uh, in the opening and closing section of Rossa's Little Van Hamuisto in List B, that uses the big string crossings at the beginning and the end. So there's that action. So it certainly turns up in the pieces. PD is about bow distribution. And here we ask for a nice full bow on the minims and an awareness of staying in the upper half or lower half where it's marked or dividing the bow equally when, the, uh, when, when you're doing the second line. The bowing issue, this bowing issue appears almost everywhere in the pieces for this level, sometimes over the whole length of the bow and sometimes within a smaller section, but the principle is the same. And what so often happens is you have... <laughs> And on that up bow, they don't get to the lower half, we stay in the middle. So of course this part of the bow gets neglected. So really emphasise. Which of course means even more work on trying to get that pinky to be curved and the fingers nice and rounded so that playing in the lower half is comfortable. And there's an extra for experts just at the end to introduce some very simple double stops. 
It's good to get started on this from the beginning so that double stopping doesn't become an issue. It's just part of playing. Um, and this will be a thread all the way through. There was a lot of comment in the last revision of the technique book. A lot of comments came in that there wasn't there wasn't enough to develop double stopping, especially earlier on, so that when it did appear, it was a bit of a trauma. So we've tried to address that. So going to grade one, what's new and what's changed? This time we've got G and A major in two octaves and the one octave minor scales of G and A. Uh, the difference from the previous book is that the harmonic minor form is the one we've used this time, not melodic minor. And there's a reason for that. It just seemed that there was much more use of the harmonic minor form in the more recently published repertoire, and it certainly appears more frequently in grade two repertoire than does the melodic minor form. So we, see, we thought it best to change to do the harmonic minor form first. We've also substituted B flat major just in one octave for the previous F major scale. It's still got the low first finger, but the actual finger pattern is three and four together on each string, which is a little friendlier than F major, which is changing on each string and a little bit, little bit trickier. Um, it's also a more commonly encountered key. Um, there are only two scale bowings now, slurred in pairs and attaché. Bow distribution pattern that we had previously is now covered in the exercises. And there's another extra for experts in this one, and this time it's the scale and arpeggio in E natural minor. Um, we haven't had one of those in the grade book before, but um, it's there if you need it. It's a key that does turn up quite a lot in the uh, in the early pieces. It's in it's used in the grade book in Salty Sailor Song in list A and also in the Old Sissy in list B and it does turn up in other places so it's there if you need it and it could be handy and it has a nice consistent pattern so that's nice. The exercises so 1A this is just a little introduction to the melodic minor form of the scale in preparation for its appearance in the scales in grade 2 we didn't have it. We don't have it in the scales in grade one, so we're putting it in the exercise so that concept is introduced. One B. Now this follows on from the extra for experts in in preliminary with the fingers on the lower string. Now <clears throat> it's important to find the right placement for the left elbow so that the backs of the fingers don't touch the E string on this one. If you're trying to play fingers on the lower string and you leave your arm there. The back of that finger is going to touch the E string, so you need to bring the elbow under a little further. And then it will work. And now 1C. Now we're taking the shifting a little further by matching notes in first and third position. Uh, this is probably the time to start looking at some material that develops reading in third position as well because it does turn up a lot from the grade two level onwards. My favourite for this is a book by Neil Mackay which is called A Tuneful Introduction to the Third Position and I think Helena has put um, all these books that I'm mentioning in the chat if you want to have a look. Anyway, it's called A Tuneful Introduction to the Third Position for Violin. Um, just a little book, not expensive or anything like that, but it, it's brilliant. It seems to work every time. Very systematic and logical in its progress, just one finger pattern at a time, one string at a time. The pieces are short and they're attractive. So I get good mileage out of that one. Um, now, going to 1D, um, this takes the bow distribution skills a little further and adds some work on Martelet and bow retakes, which are going to start appearing in the repertoire from this stage onwards. So you've just got the same bow distribution as we had before. And then some staccato. And some retakes. And then upper half for the martelet. So all, all, of, all the goodies. Um, 
There's an extra for experts at the end, just to give some practice in chromatic movement of the fingers. Now, chromatic movement's already made a small appearance in this grade. It's very briefly in Overture for Beginners in List A, and it's also in the Humperdinck Evening Prayer in List B. By grade two, it's going to be encountered all over the place, so um, this could be helpful. Now, we move to grade two. And in grade two, the keys this time are B-flat major and its relative minor, G minor, and then we have the D scales. Now, previously we had B-flat major and B-flat minor, uh, but B-flat minor has gone and it's replaced with G minor. And the reason for that is the feedback from the teachers' meetings was that B-flat minor was problematic. It had too many flats and nobody liked it. And to be honest, it doesn't appear very much in the repertoire at this level anyway. So we thought it would be a good idea to use the relative minor instead. It's much more commonly used key at this level. And it also hasn't appeared in the two octave formers yet. So that completes that um, item. Grade two is where position work, particularly third position work, starts to appear all over the place. So the in the pieces, so D major and D minor were an obvious choice for the other key because they sit well in, in third position. Just note that all the scales in this grade cover a two octave range now. I think we had a couple of one octave ones before. And the martelet bowing for the scale specifies that it's in the upper half of the bow, which it didn't before. Also note that the first arpeggio, 2.7, starts in G minor and then goes to B flat major. So you, instead of just start having the same starting note, you go. Except it's over two octaves. It flows quite easily, but just it, it's a slight departure from the pattern elsewhere. Um, there's an extra for experts in the scales and arpeggios, which gives both A minor scales in two octaves in their arpeggio. And that's um, the major scale appeared in grade one, but the minors don't appear again until grade five, and then they're in three octaves. So we thought it would be useful to have those two minors so that then the complete set of uh, two octave A scales are in the book so you can find it easily and if you if you want to teach it for a piece or something. Um, from this grade onwards, the arpeggios appear as a continuous exercise, starting with minor and then going to major. And later on we add some inversions to the arpeggios as well. So that's um, the pattern that we, we will establish as we go through. Now going to the exercises, the first one is a chromatic exercise. Um, and as I said, it's appearing a lot from second grade onwards. Uh, if you want a little bit of extra material for something like this, you can often find something in the Wolfhart studies and um, also Mary Cohen studies, the super studies are quite good and um, possibly technique takes off. But both of them, she, she, she introduces it quite a bit and, and her studies are great fun. Um, to be is a basic shifting exercise moving from first to third position. Use, and you, it's always using the same finger for the shift, so you're just playing. Um, and so on. So it's just a step beyond what we did in the previous grade. Um, it's a good idea to extend from this and find some exercises that shift between these two positions but using different combinations of fingers because that will occur in the pieces. And again, Neil Mackay comes to the rescue here. He's got a great little book called Position Changing for the Violin. It's very systematic. The other one that's useful is Sheila Nelson um, moving up again. That could be helpful because that deals with third position. And Mary Cohen's Super Studies Book 2 has quite a bit of um, moving in and out of third position. And they're very attractive studies. You hardly even notice they're a study at all. So that would be a go-to for some extra work. 2C is another simple double stop exercise in uses, using thirds, fourths, sixths and octaves with a fair few open strings sort of as landmarks um, just to help with the intonation. Um, Nice and short too. Um, 2D 
uh, bowings again, and this time introducing a couple of variants of, on hook stroke and some more demanding bow distribution. Um, so you've got ordinary hook stroke in the upper half. And then over a bigger part of the bow. And then this one. I'm going too fast though. With that fast up bow, which is often rather difficult to deal with. Um, Shevchuk Opus 2 or some of the little Decaser studies are quite useful for taking this further if you want some extra material for bowings about this sort of level. Now there's an extra for experts at the end giving a simple third position exercise in case it's needed. For candidates who need a bit more practice you can try Neil Mackay's uh, the, again the tuneful introduction to the third position. Um, now grade three. So um, we've got scales and arpeggios starting on B and C which give the op opportunity for using second position which is starting to appear in the pieces now. Just note that the slurred scales are a little slower now to allow for using whole bows, and the slurred arpeggios are also marked whole bows. In general, right through, uh, we've specified using whole bows where it's appropriate and, and adjusted the, type, the tempo markings accordin accordingly so that that lower part of the bow doesn't get neglected. Um, from grade three, we begin to introduce some inversions into the arpeggio exercise uh, and these are along the lines of what you'd find in all the standard scale methods like Bloch and Orjash and Harimali and Janke, Flesch and Galamian. Um, that's the reason they're there, that because arpeggios don't always appear in root position, they can uh, come in all shapes and sizes. So if you hardwire that in, then that bit of the piece is handled. Um, and this is also the first time that a chromatic scale appears in the first section of the technique. Now, looking at the exercises, 3A is a diminished 7th and dominant 7th exercise um, in preparation for the real thing appearing in grade 4. Now, it's so important to hardwire in the finger patterns for these two. They're often a weak link. You know, we practice all the arpeggios and then the dominant 7th and diminished 7th is at the end and we don't spend as much time. They're often weak. Um, and if you think of how often composers will fling in a really showy diminished seventh moment at the climactic piece at the end of the uh, climactic moment at the end of the piece, it can really spoil an otherwise nice performance if it doesn't work. So it's worth investing the time and getting these to work. Um, any of the standard study books like Volfart or Cass will have material that helps to reinforce this technique. It turns up in many of the little basic studies. Now, three B. It's just a little position exercise and this time it's in second position, which as I said is appearing now. Um, it's, it's such a useful position and it's so often neglected so it's really worth making the effort. And again, Neil Mackay, um, he's got another book called A Tuneful Introduction to the Second Position. Um, and there are others, Sheila Nelson's Moving Up deals with second position as well. But I must say quite often if it, with a student who comes to me later on, and um, I discovered that second position is a non-event. I have often used that same little bookmark by Mackay, and I just say, look, use this, work through it on your own, and that will, and you'll figure out second position, and it works. Again, it's systematic. The pieces are pretty. Uh, it's quite painless, and um, at the end of it, they actually know what you're talking about when you say use second position. Marvelous. Um, so three C. Uh, this one's about chords, and we're looking for a good awareness of the arm levels and bow distribution. It's the only offering in double stops department for this grade, but if you want some extra material, you could... Um, Mary Cohen's technique takes off is brilliant at this level. She's just got lots of lovely little pieces with manageable double stops, and they're pretty. But talking about the chords in this exercise, you're looking at this action, and then very little bow on the bottom of the chord and plenty on the top. So often the chord comes 
and we just don't get enough of a taste of those top two notes. You need a, a good more than three quarters of the bow on it for it to sound great. And those chords are going to turn up from now on. 3D, the bowing this time introduces spiccato for the first time and some more dotted rhythms in hook stroke and also separate at the tip and there's a little bit more bow distribution with the fast note on the down bow this time. So you're looking at spiccato sitting here and then hook stroke at the top or here which has got the fast down bow and then the slower up bow, the reverse of what we had in the previous grade. Um, the extra for experts is a little bit of shifting with various finger combinations. If you want more of it, Neil Mackay again in the position changing. So, grade four. Um, now this is the first appearance of a three octave scale in arpeggio, all starting on G. Um, the three octave arpeggios at this point they revert to just being the minor and major in root position without any inversions while the candidate gets familiar with just covering that bigger range. Um, we keep on with some two octave scales to cover a couple more keys. We've got A flat major, which is going to help us to come to terms with flat keys, and a bit more and, and a bit more familiar with those. And E major, which reinforces the use of higher positions. Fourth position is probably the new frontier in the travel up the fingerboard at this level, so E major fits very nicely with that. The two octave arpeggios retain the extra inversions, unlike the three octave ones, just the same as what we had in grade three. Just note again that the slower tempo for the slurred three octave arpeggios allows for using whole bows. Um, now, at this point, just a note of explanation about the little detour in the notes at the beginning of the three octave scale. Instead of just going up, we do this. And when we come to the end, we do that. And if you've never never used the Galamian book, you'll wonder why on earth that happened. Um, the useful, the thing that's useful about that, is that um, it means that you can group the scales in groups of threes and fours and sixes and eights and twelves and sixteens and even twenty fours later on. And that that means you can use all of the Galamian's bowing or any other person's bowing and rhythm rhythm patterns without sort of not having the right number of notes at the end of the scale. So it's very handy for practice purposes. Um, now this is also the first time we see the scales um, where are we? Uh, with, without stems. So on page 35 you've got A flat major and E major and they're just the blobs of the notes but without any stems. Um, the reason for that um, is that each it, we'd have to print in order to do the different bowing variations we'd have to print the scale three each of the scales three times so if you leave it as just the pattern and then the the scales have got no stems then you save a lot of space and a lot of trees so diminished and dominant sevenths are now part of the regular scale routine and chromatics are now in a range of two octaves now looking at the exercises 4a this is for practicing getting up to fourth position and then making a lovely sound while you're up there. So it's really important to emphasize that the point of contact of the bow moves a little closer to the bridge in fourth position because you've already got a significantly shorter length of string that's sounding. Um, this is often something that escapes the notice of the student when they're first starting to play in the higher positions. 4B it deals with a similar issue. Really. It's, a, it's a one string scale exercise and the one string scales are going to appear in the next grade in the first section. So it's a preparation for that. Now we're thinking of both the effective movement of the left arm and hand in the shifts and the adjustment of the bow's point of contact and we're trying to get a good sound on the G string. Um, these techniques are going to become more and more important as students start to explore the romantic repertoire which uses these text and techniques for expressive purposes um, and they're starting to appear sort of from about 
certainly from fifth grade onwards. So you're looking at and as you do, your bow is gradually moving from here to closer to the bridge to get a focus sound, and then back again as you go back down. For C, is a basic exercise using thirds, sixths and octaves. Um, these intervals appear as actual scales in grade five. Do notice the finger patterns for the thirds because it really helps. The first little bunch have one and two together. So if you think of that finger pattern and hang on to it, works and then the next one has all the fingers apart and the last one has three and four together and if you're aware of that then it's then it's not sort of blind man's bluff trying to find the, th the thirds you've actually got something to hang on to and it's much more likely to work. Also note with the six that you've got to point out that the minor six have the fingers touching and the major six have them not touching. Um, and double stops are making more and more of an appearance in the repertoire now and a lack of confidence in this area can limit the choice of pieces and cause a hiccup in otherwise well prepared performances. We've all seen that I'm sure. Um, it's worth making their practice a regular part of the routine. It doesn't have to be only with scales. There are other good publications and I'm sure everybody's found some. Um, I love the ones by Josephine Trott, her mel melodious double stops. They're tuneful, they're not too long, um, they don't progress too fast and from about fourth grade onwards I find they work really well. Um, and the kids will usually, you know, students will usually stick with them for longer because they're palatable. So it's worth worth a look if you haven't tried them. Um, 4D, now this is a good, this is an important one. This time the bowing exercise is in 6-8 and this gives us a chance to further develop bow distribution. The issue that arises in this exercise, the issues that arise are very typical in Baroque writing where slurs of uneven numbers of notes are interspersed with separate bows and the bow distribution can be problematic. Um, I always think of Bach, Bach's, Bach's writing that tends to do this sort of thing a lot. Um, I've used that a little zigzag symbol um, to show what the bow should be doing to make this work. So the idea is to do this. <laughs> do the up bow, I think of it as two up bows with a little sort of down bow interruption in the middle. Longer, shorter, longer. So it's like a little zigzag. I was teaching this to a student years ago and, uh, she, and it was at the time all the Harry Potter bowings, were, uh, Harry Potter uh, books were being written and she said, oh you mean like Harry Potter's scar. So in my studio we always nickname the Harry, po that, the Harry Potter bowing and if, if that appears in any shape or form and I say Harry Potter, they will instantly do the right thing. It's marvellous. So, so just think of this. Otherwise you get... trying to play the whole thing in just a tiny bit of bow at the top. Um, and then we've got a couple of other bow distribution things and a staccato and um, oh the bowing at the end. Which is such a typical bowing in all the jig movements at the end of sonatas like Corelli. Um, that was D, yes. Okay so now the extra for experts. Ah, this is a thorny one. Um, this time we've tried to give some guidance. It's really hard to have an exercise that um, tests vibrato because vibrato can come in all shapes and forms and what we're looking for. I mean some students will have done this already and developed vibrato by this stage and others may be a little bit more reluctant. Either way we're looking to see if there's a developing vibrato by the end of level one. So this exercise could be helpful. Um, the actual mechanism of a vibrato can come from the hand or from the arm. 
or possibly a mixture of the two. Um, this will be up to the teacher and also what comes most naturally to the student. Uh, the printed exercise, the the wobbly one at the end, should work well with either mechanism. But teaching vibrato, so this is an entire workshop in itself, um, so I probably can't go into a huge amount of detail here. Uh, but for further study, um, it can be helpful to watch some videos on the topic. Um, I found the ones in the Paul Rowland, uh, Paul Rowland did some videos in his teaching of action in string playing project which was oh, 40 years or more ago now, I think, but they're wonderful videos. He videoed the actual action, and sometimes with little lights on their arms and things so you can actually see what's moving where. They're great. They give you an idea of what's actually going on and a systematic approach to teaching it. Um, that can be really helpful, both for teacher and student, I think. Now, moving to grade five. What's new? Um, we're now, we're now moving up the three octave range to A and B flat, with both minors in each key this time. Just note that again the, slur, the slurred bowing of the scales now stipulates whole bows. In the two octave scales we've got E flat this time, so there's another dose of flats, and only two bowings now for these scales. Um, Again, the slurred arpeggios in, both three, th arpeggios in both three and two octaves are to be played with whole bows, as are the diminished and dominant sevenths, and the chromatics, which are now grouped in. So the dominant and diminished and chromatic is now developed, is uh, integrated into one little exercise um, or item. The one string scales are part of the first section now, and we have scales in broken thirds, sixths, and octaves in A and B flat. Looking at the exercises, which I'll find eventually, there they are. Okay, so 5A, this is another fourth position exercise, but this time we're focusing on really shifting up and backwards and forwards from it so we get a sense of the distance. Um, 5B, we've kept this little extract from Volfart for, uh, for it comes out of the one of the Volfart study books. Uh, for turns. It's the same one we had in the previ previous book. It's still the nicest one I could find. I searched everywhere. I looked at all the others and they tend to be less interesting. So it, it works really well. So we kept this one. Um, grace notes and turns along with assorted other ornaments do start to appear more frequently from this point and we start to, especially as we're starting to explore the classical repertoire in more detail. Um, it's not that easy to find supplementary material in, in a concise place. It sort of tends to be scattered around in, and you know you find this, a study here and a study there, so it's a bit hard to find. There's a useful section in the Peters Violin Schulwerk book. Oops. Can I find it? Possibly not. No. There it is. This. If anybody's found that. This is a brilliant little book because he, the studies are actually grouped by the type of thing that they're about. So there's a section on chromaticism, a section on ornaments, a section on double stops. It can be a useful thing to have around if you're having trouble with a particular issue. Um, but that you'll find you'll find um, some ornamentation things in some of the other Wolfhart books of studies, Opus 54 as well as 45. And there's some in Mazas books one and two particularly. Now 5C, um, now we're into four note chords uh, which appear all over the place in the repertoire by this stage and notably in the Karl Bohm Saravan which is in List C. It's a very good example. Um, the bow distribution is fairly crucial again like the three note chords to get them to sound good. Just not too much bow on the lower notes and plenty on the top and even more action of the upper arm so that you get from one level to the other so you've got Big drop as you go over. And then 5D, this time we're looking at staccato um, and slurs that are off the beat and ricochet. Um, and these are turning up now in the pieces. Um, I've used a little Shevchek melody for this exercise. It's, it's quite useful because it splits nicely, it's six lines long and it splits nicely into three sections. So if you're working on bowings, even other bowings, um, 
you can do one bowing on the first two lines and one on the next two and so you can get three done with one playing through the exercise so that we, we feel as though we've done quite a lot in a short space of time. So we're looking just an, for a nice even staccato. <laughs> set up a half of the bow. And then nice articulation on these ones. And then with the ricochet in the middle, it helps to start off with a bit of a bounce like that, just to get a feeling of the natural spring of the bow. And then go sideways. And then see... the student gets the hang of just letting the bow do the bouncing um, then they can start experiment with it, experimenting with it. Uh, really important to introduce that bowing and, and to get the hang of it. The first time I ever encountered it was when I was in an orchestra and we had to play the William Tell Overture and I can tell you it was a it was a it was a bit of a fright. Um, I wish I'd learned it earlier. Um, so I've used, as I was saying, um, there's an extra for experts, and it's the same exercise again, but it's just printed plain, um, same little melodies as, as um, 5D. You can add any bowings you like. It's just handy to have it there. Shevchek actually came up with 260 variations for this one, so um, if you really want to have a look at those and you're curious, it's Opus 2, Part 1, Number 5. And now we come to grade six. Um, so what's new and what's changed? Um, it's C and D and three octaves and again they appear without stems uh, on the notes because we've got three different bowing patterns. F major is the two octave key and ideally I'd play this in fifth position but you can do it in sixth if you wish. Um, the important thing is to gain confidence navigating across the strings rather than shifting up and down as we do on the three octave scales. Agility across the strings in higher positions is necessary for a lot of the repertoire that we as we move forward from here. Um, also note that the uh, whole bows are required for the slurred bowings. Um, the one string scales now include both minors and, and we have third, sixth and octaves in both keys. But we've trimmed the top bit off C major and third so all the double stops are only in a one octave range which is, um, I think, an improvement. Now, in the exercises... Okay, here they are. Okay, 6A. Um, now we're focusing on fifth position uh, as we move up the uh, fingerboard. So this exercise is for shifting from to and from fifth position. And it's always worth, worth reminding your students to swing the left arm to the right and to the left so the fingers can play in first can all the fingers can actually play in fifth position when they get there so if you're doing that's why the fourth finger is there if you shift do that that fourth finger's not re going to reach so as you do the shift you've got to come round enough to get over this part of the violin sufficiently so that the fourth finger and all the other fingers can actually get to the notes they're going to play so just that's the important thing, I think, to emphasise when they first start practising that exercise. 6B. So this is about tone, um, the main issue in this exercise. Um, by the time we get to fifth position, the string lengths are quite a lot shorter, so the bow needs to move towards the bridge to focus the sound. Um, and it's always worth pointing out to your students that the fingerings in the fifth position, up to fourth finger on the A string, are the same as for first position. So, so long as you put your fingers on the next string down, you, you'll, you'll be able to read it. Once that concept clicks, there's usually not much trouble reading in fifth position, which is an advantage. 6C is a string crossing, quite a big string, a string crossing exercise. Um, it requires some agility and awareness, uh, but it's, it's all really fundamental stuff. The, um, the notes explain what to look for, and if you want a bit more of the second for a, a bowing variant, you could try Kreutzer 13. That's so. This that's this variant I'm talking about. So 
So you use the upper arm to do the string crossing. First one, and then that action. I think we need to do that with the screen a little bit. If you want a bit extra on that, Kreutzer 13 is the thing. My old landlady in London, used, it sounds like Bach, and my old landlady in London used to ask me, what is that you're practising? Is it Bach? Happened about three times. Um, anyway, um, and then the later ones. Keep the arm moving, this part moving. And the chords at the end, we ask for one stroke chords on the quavers, which means aiming at the middle string and then a normal chord which is broken. One string. All right, and now grade seven. Oh no, there's an extra for excerpt, experts. I mustn't, mustn't miss that. Um, this time it's a bit of fun working out left hand pizzicato. This technique may not have appeared much up to this point, but when it does appear, and they've never encountered it, things can go rather slowly um, and be distressing. So, touching on it now might set them up better, and it's quite fun to do. Um, and when they decide they want to sat play Sarasado's Malaguena, at least you're in with a start. So, numbers, grade seven. Um, now we have two different keys. We've got A flat and E in three octaves. And we have inversions in the arpeggios again, but the two octave scales have disappeared. The slurred bowings are in whole bows, they're a little slower. Um, the dominant and diminished and chromatic routine has some broken thirds added, so it's just very similar to what the Carl Flesch routine does. Um, the scales on one string are moving a bit faster, but only one is required for each key in the exam. It's probably a really good idea to try doing them on other strings as well, just to strengthen the technique and add some variety, but there's only one on each string in each key for the exam. Double stops are much the same, but note that um, E major in thirds is now only one octave in range, which means that the very high bit's not there. Um, and the exercises. Okay, so 7A. It's just a little coordination exercise with three and just getting one and four to land and lift simultaneously which is a surprisingly complex operation sometimes and you'll find it lurking in Fiorello number 12 which is in list A so if you're doing that one the exercise is for you. Um, 7b uh, now this one can this sort of thing can appear to be a bit of a mystery the diamond shaped notes are natural harmonics as we all know and the resultant pitches can be quite different from what you'd expect from the placement of the actual um, harmonics. Um, but if you play them with harmonic pressure of the fingers and with the indicated fingerings and in the right positions, then the top notes will sound. The upper notes in the brackets are not to be played. They're just there so you know what you should be hearing. But just keep in mind that it'll only happen if the fingers are in tune. So just demonstrating that. What, what's written is, that's what's written, but if you play it as harmonics, this comes out. position. Brilliant. Now 7C. So now we come to some really big shifts so be even more aware of the swing of the arm under and around the instrument to get those top notes. You have to come way around. So the thumb, depending on the, on, on the size of the hand, for me I have to come round, round that far. 
to get to that top note. And 17. So now we're heading into more virtuoso end of the repertoire. If your student's playing Viotti 23, they'll certainly need these bow strokes, but they do appear in a lot of the more showy repertoire. So we've got different, uh, we've got hook stroke or dotted notes at hook strokes and, and dotted rhythm at the tip. We've got staccatos. <laughs> but nice and nice and manageable with four bounces on each note at this stage um, and that's seventh grade so eighth grade a few changes here the three octave scales are on B and E flat and the arpeggio exercise now has all the inversions that you would find in the flesh system the diminished dominant broken third and chromatic exercise is now over a range of three octaves, not two octaves. And the one string scales have a few extra bits and pieces, but there's only two of them. Of course, it's a good idea to do them on the other strings, but just not for the exam. Um, for those familiar with the old syllabus, the change to note is that the four, um, four octave... Um, no, hang on. The change to note is that four of the double stop scales are now in the same keys as the three octave scales. So you've got you've got double st stops in B and E flat. We've got B in thirds and octaves, E flat in sixths and octaves, and G minor in thirds and sixths. And the other thing is that the four octave scale in arpeggio on G is now in extra for experts. So you can do it, but you don't have to do it for the exam. Okay, exercises. So, 8a. Um, this introduces fingered octaves and tenths. And the important thing with these is always to emphasise stretching the, the lower finger back. So, don't make the first finger happy and do that. Make the third finger happy and stretch, stretch the first finger back because this finger's got a lot more give in it than this poor thing. And in my case, it has to that joint has to lean quite a long back and it, way back. And it's the same thing for the tenths. Get the fourth finger happy and stretch the first finger back. It's just to get used to that shape. This exercise, eight B. Now. We've got our first orchestral excerpt, and it's taken from Prokofiev's Romeo and Juliet. Um, moving fluently from arco to pizzicato requires dexterity, and it's an essential and frequently encountered technique in orchestral writing. It's also very hazardous in unskilled hands. You can drop the bow, you can take chunks out of your violin, you can not get to the pizzicato in time. So it's a really important one to practice. Sarasate tends to use the, or Spanish composers in general, tend to use that effect quite a lot because they're often imitating flamenco writing. But it's everywhere in orchestral writing. And by this stage, your student's very likely to be in a youth orchestra. So it's going to turn up. So, you... so you've got to be quick to get that finger out to do the pizzicato. You certainly can't put your thumb on the side of the fingerboard and, and do that because there's just not time. So going from that to that to that to that is, is the issue here. And that, that really does take a bit of practice, but it's certainly very useful. Um, 8C. Now here we here we use an extract from the wonderful melody in the slow movement of Tchaikovsky's Symphony Number no. Five. That makes it really worthwhile working on a beautiful tone and fluent shifts. Um, please encourage your students to listen to a recording so they can imagine the context and hear the style of playing. It's a, it's a it's a gorgeous excerpt. It's really worth playing. And 8D. It's just a final little sautier, this time with only two bounces on each note. Nice and short, but some string crossings just to make sure it's all working. So, that was our journey through the technical book. I'll hand back to Steve and I'll see if there are any questions. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Philippa. Um, and while we've got you, uh, I just thought we'd give a further opportunity 
for uh, all of our attendees to send in any questions that they might have. Um, we've had a couple of questions that's uh, that have come through, which I'll, I'll try and run through now, just so that everybody's aware. One question that comes up um, at the end of, of each syllabus's life and the beginning of, of each new syllabus's life <clears throat> is about the, the transition period. Um, there's a tr two year transition period in most cases between old AMEB syllabuses and new AMEB syllabuses, which means you have two years, uh, basically grace time to uh, transition onto the new material. Now, that means during those two years, both the old and the new syllabuses will be examined concurrently but you have to choose either the old or the new. You can't have the technical work from the new syllabus with the, with the manual lists and, and repertoire from the old syllabus. The syllabus is a, a designed to work together as a, as a whole. Um, so you can either choose the old syllabus, uh, which was last printed in the 2020 manual, um, and, and that's complete. So the old technical work, the old repertoire, the old series of grade books, or you can use the new syllabus um, with the technical work that we've just gone through uh, and the new repertoire, which includes the series 10 grade books. It also includes series nine, uh, which is all on the new syllabus and the, the adjustments to the manual lists that have been made for the new syllabus. Uh, let's just go through some more of the questions that have come through. So, We've had a question. There was a debate with a couple of teachers regarding scales without stems to play the final note to complete the bar or same rhythm as the front with rests to end the bar. I assume that's talking about... Uh, I just play a long note, I think. So just play an, a long note fi just, uh, uh, as a pause on a, the final trying note. A, just trying to find a good example. Um, Oh, yes, I see what you mean. So, um, yeah, so, so if you were in sixth grade and you were doing it, um, um, I'd do that. So, I, on the last note, I'd just play it as a long note. Is that the question? Uh, I believe so. Yes. No, um, I, I wouldn't play. I wouldn't do that. It sounds weird. So just, just a long note. Now, the, there has been in the past a little bit of, uh, uh, well, the, there's been a few questions about these stemless note heads. Um, do, would you like to talk a little bit about why we use the stemless note heads in the instances that we do? Well, I, I did mention it as I was talking my way through. It, it, it's um, in the Gala, well, in, if for, for us, for instance, if you look at the beginning of grade six, um, we've got three different bowings. We've got and, and we have to print it. Um, We'd have to print each of the scales three times in order to make it, uh, if we were going to print with stems everything that they have to play, each scale would have to be printed three times with the three different bowings, which is not not particularly efficient of space and trees and it's cluttered. And I'm just looking and see if fifth grade has a good example, yeah. So it's really but, where... Uh, yeah. And if you look at the two octave scale in grade five, the E flat, you've got. And again, you'd have to print all three scales twice in order to because the two, the two the two patterns are different are different. So and but more to the point. I was mentioning earlier that the Galamia has a whole set of, um, there's a whole booklet of different bowing patterns and rhythm patterns that you can apply to the scales. Now, if the scale, scales are printed as stem, stemless, like so, for instance, if you're in D major and you've got, 
you can play you can practice it with let's say that it's the rhythms the the groups of four rhythms so you could do You could, if if it's if it's printed that way, you can apply any of hundreds of different bowing uh, bowing or rhythm patterns to the same scale. So it's really about removing the rhythmic information, so uh, where the different bowing patterns require different rhythms. Yeah. So so yeah, it it just makes the scale much more versatile for practice purposes. If you if you print it. Um, for instance, in, in the Carl Flesch, I don't know whether I've got it, so I don't think I've, no, I haven't got the book with me at the moment, but in Carl Flesch, he does it a different way. Um, he prints everything, ya, da, 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 I think he does it with a, with, with a rhythm variation as well. And then each different scale is printed with a different bowing. So C major's got one bowing, A minor has another bowing, um, uh, F major has a, yet another bowing, D minor has yet another bowing, and so on, all the way through the book. So, so it, it looks, um, and what, you, what you're meant to do is apply each of those different bowings to any one of the other scales. It's very confusing, very confusing, and it looks very cluttered, actually. Um, whereas this, this is nice and plain, and, it's, and, it, and it's, um, it also gets you into the habit of being able to apply those things in another con context. So, for instance, if you've got a really nasty, if you've got a really nasty passage um, like um, oh, one of those big arpeggio passages in a Sanson, in the Sanson Concerto or, or, or Lalo Symphony Espanol and you want to practice that with... Um, Different rhythms or something you can play ya da 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 or da 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 da. You can practice it with all those different rhythms. You've sort of got into the habit of applying that that practice routine through the scales, and you can then apply that when you're practicing other things. So it's 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 um it's got a lot of spin-offs for actually good practice techniques in other contexts other than just with the scales. I find um, because the, the the students get used to just seeing the, the, the stemless notes and then applying a pattern. Once they can do that, then they'll be able to do it anywhere else. And that's really incredibly useful for developing technique, I find. Right, thank you. Um, another question that's come through that I should be able to answer, uh, what is in the AMEB Violin Handbook? Um, in the handbooks, there is a discussion of each of the pieces in the gradebook. Uh, and that discussion includes some background information, some historical information, uh, information about the composers, uh, and then quite a detailed analysis, um, which goes far beyond uh, the, the requirements for the general knowledge uh, questions for each grade. Um, but is really very illuminating for both teachers and candidates. So if you're ever in, a, in the middle of a piece and you're not sure whether you're in some kind of mode or, or exactly what's going on, um, the, the violin handbooks is, is where you might be able to go to find that information. So it's, it's all of the background information for each of the pieces that are in the grade books, basically for the, for the Amy B violin handbooks. Um, we've got another question. Uh, my question is for the grade six double stop 6.12. I, I assume that's for the old of the old technical work. Uh, is it being retained for the linked Boeing? Is that something that you're able to answer or we might have to get back to the person that asked that question. How... Oh, gonna, I, I was just reading one of the chats. You're going to have to uh, uh, ask the question again. I'm sorry, Steve. Sure. Uh, so for, for grade six, double stops, uh, the old, I guess it's the old 6.12. Um, is it being retained for the linked Boeing? I'm sorry. I don't, I don't quite understand. No. Are, we talking about, are we talking about the the old book or well, the 6.12 is is a is a two octave is a two octave arpeggio in the new one in the old book 
Ah, I see. In the in the old book, um, six point twelve is ya da 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 da. That was was an arpeggio with a with a rhythm variation. Right. So is that is that being retained for the linked bowing? I'm not entirely sure whether that question makes sense. We might have to go back to the person who asked. That, that, that Boeing has gone and, and it's just, everything's in six, eight now. It's just, it's just straight, uh, even the quavers are the separate bows or slurred in sixes in the new syllabus. In the old syllabus, it wasn't. It was slurred in sixes and then there was a ya, da, 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 a rhythm variation for the first one. But right. I'm not quite sure what we mean by the hooked Boeing. If, if the person who wanted the answer could elaborate on that. I'll, I'll have a go at it. We'll we'll get back to that that person. Uh, in we'll be able to get them back to them privately. Thank you very much. Um, so again, this is this is regarding the old and the new syllabus. Uh, just to confirm, is this correct? Old syllabus, series nine technical workbook, uh, and includes series eight and nine pieces, uh, and and then the twenty twenty manual lists. That's correct. And the new syllabus includes the series 10 technical workbook or or the new technical workbook with the, with the cover that is currently behind me uh, the series 10 grade books the series 9 grade books also and of course the manual lists that appear in the current manual that's the 2022 manual so that just to confirm, that's that's the difference between the old and new. But basically, the 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 syllabus uh, that appears in this year's manual is the new syllabus, and the syllabus that appeared in last year's manual is the old syllabus. So if you if you get a copy of the twenty twenty one manual and the downloadable syllabus, which will be available on the AMEB website, um, that that's the old syllabus and needs to be used entirely. Uh, okay, just a just a little. Uh, Steve, there was a question from Loretta, I think, about, um, I think she was wondering if there was an extra, extra for experts in grade seven, uh, but we didn't, we didn't have one. There's, there's, it, I mean, ex, I don't think there's, a, there's not an extra for experts in, experts in grade seven or in, yeah, there is one in grade eight, but no, somehow we just didn't come up with one for grade seven. Sorry. Great. Okay. Sorry. Bear with me one moment. I'll see if there's any more questions that we can ask. There are questions about the new uh, syllabus grade books in, in, with regards to recordings. So we are in the final stages of finishing the recorded accompaniments for uh, Violin Series 10. They'll be out very shortly and available online. Um, no more CDs, of course, uh, mostly because nobody owns a CD player anymore. So they'll, they'll all be available online. In terms of the demonstration recordings, uh, at this stage, we're not too sure when they might be available. Um, we're looking into different ways of producing these demonstration recordings and, and a different model, um, basically because of, of the vast amount of resources that it takes to, to produce recordings of every single piece in the grade books. Um, we're, we're looking at uh, alternatives. So at this stage, there's no demonstration recordings uh, for every single piece in the grade book currently. Um, but we'll keep you up to date if, uh, if that changes and, and if something is going to happen in that space. Um, do, do, do. So in terms of extra lists and own choice, we've got a question that's come through. Uh, can you use older series for extra lists and own choice? Yes, that's absolutely appropriate. So an extra list or own cho choice piece, uh, the principle behind that is that it's a piece of the same educational value, uh, at the same standard. And so obviously if, uh, if it's a piece that's appeared previously in a, in a grade book for that grade, it's probably a good, a good bet for an extra list or an own choice. Similarly, if you are using the old 
syllabus uh, and something in the in the new uh, grade books really appeals, then that would also be most likely an appropriate choice for an extra list or own choice work. Um, along with with uh, you know pieces that are on the manual lists, et cetera, et cetera. So as long as it's of the same educational value, that's the principle behind choosing works for extra lists and own choice. Uh, can we use series nine pieces with the new workbook? Yes, so the series nine, uh, as, as I mentioned, the, the series nine grade books are on the new syllabus. Uh, so absolutely you can use series nine with the new technical work. And I think that's more or less what we have time for. We will try and get back to uh, anybody with, with particular questions that I haven't answered. Um, in uh, after the conclusion of this webinar. But in the meantime, I think we're almost at the end. So I have to say thank you very much, Philippa, uh, for that wonderful workshop and for your amazing tireless work over the last couple of years in bringing the new syllabus and uh, resources to fruition. Um, as I mentioned at the beginning, uh, we have a competition with our very generous competition partner, Glanville & Co. Uh, you or your students could win a new Glanville Daintree D20 violin valued at $2,700, um, as well as Daddario Kaplan strings and an AMEB violin series 10 book pack. Um, and you can do that by answering the following question. What's your favorite piece from the series 10 violin grade books? And how would a new Glanville and Co. Daintree D20 violin help you play it at your best? Uh, you can answer in one of the following formats, either written in 100 words or less with an image or in a 30 second video. So be creative as you like. There are also three runner up prizes, which include a set of Daddario Kaplan strings and an AMEB book prize, uh, an AMEB book pack. There's a link on the screen that will lead you to more information. And this link will also be emailed to you at the conclusion of the launch event. Uh, the, co the competition runs until March 31st. So grab your grade books as soon as possible and start exploring. The syllabus, uh, the new syllabus, the series 10 grade books and the other resources are available now via your local music shop, via ameb.edu.au and via other online sheet music retailers. Um, I have to say thank you once again to Philippa Page, the Principal Consultant for the Violin Syllabus Project and Principal Architect of the, of the technical work, as well as the other consultants and contributors to the syllabus and books. Uh, Julie Hewison for Level 1, Karen Chan for Level 2, uh, Finton Murphy for Level 3, the consultant team, uh, sight reading composers Loretta Finn and Nerida Erstenbrook, our typesetting and proofreading team, and the many Australian and international composers whose work make the gradebooks so very good. Thanks also to the behind the scenes AMEB team, Bernard de Pasquale, AMEB CEO, and Helena Jones, Maxine Day, and Alana Caldwell for making this workshop possible. Uh, and last but certainly not least, thank you to all of you who are attending this workshop, either uh, live or viewing it later on on YouTube. We will put the work, uh, workshop up on YouTube uh, for, for people to view that weren't able to be here today. We really hope that the new violin syllabus and publications serve the violin community as a useful and inspiring resource uh, for years to come. So thanks again and goodbye. <laughs>